All right, so Murat, I think we can uh, we can start. So let me start by thanking everyone for joining the, the Glaze webinar series today. Uh, my name is Eric Matos. I'm the executive director of the Greenhouse Lighting and Systems Engineering Consortium called Glaze. And the Glaze webinar series is a selection of live recorded online presentations that cover a broad range of topics related to the controlled environmental agriculture. Uh, these webinars feature the latest technological innovations and best practices in the CEA field, providing the audience the opportunity to discover new solutions and to connect with field experts. So it is my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Murat Kassira. Murat is the director of the Environment Agriculture Center, and he's a professor in the Biosystems Engineering Department at the University of Arizona. He received his bachelor's degree in agricultural engineering in Kukorva University in Turkey and his master's and PhD degrees from food and agricultural biological engineering from the Ohio State University here in the US. His research involves automation, environmental control, alternative energy integrated CEA systems and resource use optimization in controlling environment agriculture systems, including greenhouses and uh, vertical farming based plant factories with artificial lighting. He's a member of the American Society of Agricultural Biological Engineers, also known as ASABI, American Society for Horticultural Science, ASHS, and, <clears throat> excuse me, the International Society for Horticultural Science, ISHS. He also serves as the chair for the Division Precision Agriculture Engineering under the ISHS. Uh, I would like to let everyone know that a recorded version of this webinar will be available at our website, glaze.org, uh, in a week from now, where you can find not only this presentation, but all the other webinars that we hosted as of today. If you have any questions about this presentation, please use the Q&A section. There is an icon at the bottom of the screen. If you send the questions to the chat, we can answer, but they are easy to get lost. So if you use the Q&A, it's a much better way to go. That said, Dr. Murat, please, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Eric. I really appreciate uh, the, the nice uh, introduction and also the opportunity again uh, to participate in the uh, webinar series. Um, so uh, today I, I will be uh, sharing with you uh, some of the um, uh, very recent work that we uh, have done, uh, research uh, conducted on um, uh, environmental controls uh, leading to resource use efficiency, uh, optimizing resource efficiency in controlled environment agriculture and particularly vertical farming systems. Um, I want to say that um, uh, an important factor affecting the, uh, the profitability of vertical farming is uh, first the grower's ability to consistently uh, create an environment that is optimal uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the plant uh, yield and also the quality and productivity. In order to achieve this, uh, there are various, of course, uh, factors. One is the grower's ability, as well as the physical system's capability, the technology, uh, uh, this capability to uh, create uh, the required uh, environments. Uh, and then I think the next step is to identify um, uh, the uh, opportunities or possibilities uh, by co-optimizing the environmental variables uh, to achieve resource savings, uh, and this will lead to uh, optimized resource use efficiency in controlled environment agriculture systems, particularly in vertical farming uh, settings. I want to say that um, looking towards future, there will be definitely um, a, a, a complementary nature of both field-based agriculture uh, but I think the controlled environment agriculture with greenhouses and vertical farms will continue to play a significant role to address the needs for uh, producing food and nourishing uh, people and feeding people populations, and that is uh, increasing under the constraints of limited uh, resources. When it comes to controlled environment agriculture, there are different uh, technology levels that can be considered from low-tech greenhouses to high-tech greenhouses using natural sunlight. In some locations, we need to supplement that light because that is not available at the optimal levels. Uh, but the vertical farms uh, are also have been becoming very attractive with uh, 
providing uh, advantages uh, in terms of uh, a growing, uh, leading to uh, uh, high yields, uh, production capabilities uh, within a smaller footprint. Uh, working and growing food in an, of course, uh, in an environment that is highly confined and controlled, that also brings the need for uh, uh, resource inputs uh, in the case of vertical farms, definitely for electrical energy, for lighting, uh, for air conditioning, and that uh, is needing attention to uh, really evaluate the technology, the engineering and uh, of the system, as well as the uh, strategies to operate, maintain the conditions. Of course, that has to meet the expectations of the crop from that environment. And also we need to add the operator's capabilities and ability uh, and experiences to make sure that this system is well orchestrated, collaborating with the environmental control uh, systems. When it comes to any kind of uh, agricultural production uh, strategy, uh, uh, we need to consider the resource use efficiency. And that is the, to maximize the plant growth with the minimum uh, resources inputs, uh, contributing to minimum uh, uh, emissions of the environmental pollutants and also minimum costs for the resources used. So the resources efficiency in general is defined as the ratio of the crop yield out output uh, to the uh, resources consumed. And if you look at the greenhouse systems as well as the vertical farming systems, on the left-hand side of this uh, picture here, we have the resource inputs required for plant production, energy, waters, carbon dioxide, fertilizer, and label. And on the other hand, we have the, uh, the production outputs or system outputs, uh, edible biomass, of course, that's this our uh, interest there um, to maximize that and reduce the non-edible biomass, which can actually be uh, recycled and maybe uh, some products could be developed using non-edible biomass and can be returned and utilized uh, back in the production uh, system. Of course, the nutrients and water is, are being recycled in the controlled environment agriculture uh, system uh, technologies. Uh, that helps us to really enhance and achieve high resource use efficiencies uh, with that recycling capabilities and also transpired water. The transpired water from the environment, especially in vertical farming settings, can be harvested from the air and with some maybe treatments can be used back in the, within the system. So with our research emphasis, particularly what I do in my research uh, actually programs, I uh, pay attention to the left-hand side of this image where the resource inputs are considered uh, with the environmental control uh, applications, but also paying attention to the numerator of that equation, uh, considering the edible biomass, uh, as well as other outputs where we have some opportunities for uh, recycling. Um, in terms of the difference between uh, field-based agriculture and controlled environment agriculture, in the controlled environment agriculture settings, we have almost complete control on both in the demand and supply uh, of the uh, environment uh, in that uh, production setting. So um, if we are able to integrate and consider sensing the environment, understanding the plant and microclimate interactions, we have a better uh, a chance to develop uh, resource uh, conserving control and management practices and strategies in the in the controlled environment agriculture systems. This image is representative of a greenhouse system, greenhouse controlled environment agriculture system. Some of these are also relevant to vertical farming based crop production, but the idea, the message here is that um, the resource savings and production quality can be achieved if we can combine the physics of the environment. This is the technology, the systems, uh, and the physics of it uh, with the crop physiological information. So the physics as well as the biology integration would help us, will help us to uh, create uh, strategies leading to, uh, or applications leading to resource uh, conservation. Uh, traditionally, the sensing and monitoring and environmental controls uh, have been focused more on the aerial environment as well as the root zone environment with some sensors used providing information 
and an onto control system basing the controls over that aerial and root zone environments. I am a strong believer of this, the, uh, the plant-based, plant-centric uh, uh, control applications where we can use plants as sensors to communicate their needs. And this can be achieved through uh, sensors monitoring the plant growth, uh, plant uh, information, maybe the color of it, the texture of it, temperature of it, but also uh, prediction capabilities for the biomass growth using or uh, using sensor fusion uh, with direct information communicated, or maybe some of this information being used to, uh, to uh, as inputs uh, with the models that can enable a grower or maybe environmental controller uh, uh, with prediction capabilities leading to control uh, applications. And when you uh, approach this way to this control uh, problem, uh, there are a lot of, there is a large data set that needs to be considered both with the plant as well as the growing environment related uh, uh, and with data being processed leading to, of course, uh, decision support, crop diagnostics, decision support and control action uh, capabilities. Um, computer vision, uh, non-contact sensing uh, have been among the emerging automation technologies uh, with automated crop diagnostics and decision support systems. As you can see in this image, uh, this technology has been implemented in greenhouse settings uh, with uh, texture, color, temporal, spatial uh, changes in the crop canopy. Um, enabling the grower to develop a better understanding of the crop response to specific environments and with the possibility of including that uh, in the uh, decision uh, making or control applications. We have been working in this area with multi uh, wavelength based multi uh, uh, a spectrum uh, uh, computer vision applications to uh, uh, develop uh, plant health and growth monitoring systems uh, where a computer uh, vision systems could actually uh, scan the canopy uh, at dedicated times and uh, determine the deviations of the crop uh, with the signatures that we are trying to uh, monitor from a normal expected uh, growth. Again, this is through plant uh, physical growth uh, uh, trend changes, as well as textural, temporal, and temperature uh, changes observed with some statistics behind this to enable to create an image, for example, as you can see on the lower right hand corner of this slide, uh, informing the grower with red zones being troubled zones with stresses and with uh, green zones indicating the healthier uh, crop uh, uh, growth patterns. Uh, these technologies with uh, uh, crop uh, computer vision based uh, diagnostics is being considered and implemented uh, in uh, vertical farming systems, in addition to other sensing and environmental monitoring uh, capabilities. With vertical farms, uh, the technology is either uh, small scale, maybe shipping containers, a, a container based uh, uh, approach, but in, in, in larger settings, in uh, uh, in warehouses, uh, uh, the multi-tiered systems are used uh, with different kinds of uh, uh, hydroponics-based hydroponics -based, uh, uh, plant production systems uh, trying to uh, produce uh, and, and um, uh, grow the crop with multiple uh, 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 cycles of growth uh, leading to a significant yield uh, outcome using a smaller uh, footprint. Also with the ability of being able to produce anywhere, any climate, close proximity to the market is uh, have been the attractive uh, uh, have been the attraction to these vertical farming uh, systems. Um, however, we also observe challenges uh, to grow produce in vertical farming uh, systems, uh, especially when it comes to uh, the uh, the electrical energy used uh, uh, in vertical farming systems, and also the three dimensional. Uh, nature of this growing uh, environments where the ability to create a uniform environment is really uh, has been the challenge. So um, um, knowing this uh, challenges and uh, uh, considering the demand uh, 
for the research and development, uh, we have we have been funded through USDA uh, NIFA program uh, in a multi-state uh, collaborative effort between Michigan State, Ohio State, and Purdue University uh, to uh, uh, to consider and develop. Uh, control strategies around uh, co-optimization of variables with temperature, humidity, light, uh, vapor pressure deficit, carbon dioxide uh, levels for vertical farming uh, systems. Of, of course, the plant quality attributes are part of this uh, effort as we are uh, looking into uh, the crop response uh, with the yield and quality attributes under unique uh, environmental conditions. At the end, our goal is to uh, develop and uh, provide uh, uh, information for the industry uh, for the uh, uh, growing conditions, uh, recipes for the environment, environmental recipes, um, control strategies, uh, and, and hopefully uh, an economic model that will uh, help the uh, industry or the future users or technology developers to consider these uh, research outcomes uh, and uh, further develop uh, the vertical farming systems and applications. As part in, in the case of University of Arizona, our research in the vertical farming research uh, have been conducted in our vertical farming facility here uh, at the Control Environment Agriculture Center campus. We have a 750 square uh, feet uh, uh, footprint uh, facility where we have two growth uh, chambers here, uh, allowing us to create control conditions as well as treatment conditions in the other room with the same hardware. These are deep water culture circulating systems uh, used uh, with LED lighting uh, for us to conduct our experiments and our students, graduate and undergraduate students are uh, a really integral part of these uh, research programs. They're, they're actually leads uh, in these uh, research uh, activities. Uh, one of the research that we conducted uh, really focused on um, uh, the, the light intensity uh, or the daily light integral accumulated uh, light during the photo period as well as the CO2 uh, use or enrichment uh, in vertical farming system with uh, lettuce uh, uh, crop. Uh, the emphasis here was uh, what if uh, we can maybe uh, uh, alleviate the CO2 while maybe um, reducing the amount of light uh, we can use or maybe shorten the daily light integrals or reduce the daily light integrals to achieve uh, the unexpected, uh, desirable actually crop uh, yield and quality, uh, and with this approach leading to uh, energy savings, uh, special energy savings for, for lighting. As you can see, we have uh, evaluated seven different light uh, daily light integrals uh, with the associated uh, electrical energy use. As you can see, the uh, fresh weight uh, uh, per head basis, but when it comes to electrical use efficiency, they are pretty much uh, similar. So at the end here, uh, it, uh, this information can be used by the operator or maybe an environmental control strategy to consider uh, this approach uh, with the, uh, with the uh, potentials for savings for the daily light integral, maybe dimming the lights a little bit uh, with the with a sacrifice of reduced yield. However, again, uh, within the marketable yield capabilities and quality attributes leading to significant um, energy uh, savings. Another challenge in the vertical farming uh, uh, production uh, uh, settings uh, is the uh, non-uniform environment uh, when it comes to airflow uh, and in turn with that, uh, the other environmental variables such as air temperature, humidity, vapor pressure deficit, and also CO2 uh, uh, uniformity concentrations in the growing uh, space. So without this environmental uniformity, uh, uh, this would lead to um, challenges with uh, crop disorders or um, uh, photosynthesis or transpiration rate being uh, negatively affected. And in, uh, in a vertical farming setting, you would see uh, um, various uh, different kinds of approach to uh, improve the environmental uniformity with, um, uh, as you can see, airflow systems, air distribution systems positioned between aisles on the ceiling, or maybe with fans uh, installed in various 
uh, locations in the vertical farming uh, uh, system uh, to um, improve the environmental uniformity. Um, one of the uh, uh, major challenge, especially with uh, lettuce crop growing in vertical farming system uh, has been the tip burn issues. And this is because of the, you know, the airflow enhances actually the plant transpiration uh, with an increase or with an optimal uh, level of uh, plant transpiration. That this helps uh, for the transport of the nutrients from the root zone and its allocation to the growing tissues and growing uh, leaves. So with the lack of uh, proper air uh, current speed or air flow around the plant uh, uh, canopy surfaces, especially the uh, growing shoot, uh, growing uh, le young leaves, um, the allocation of calcium is not uh, optimal at optimal level, creating uh, leading to tip burn uh, issues. So there's a need to create a more uh, dynamic turbulent flow around the young leaves uh, to enhance actually transpiration for the improved uh, nutrient uh, transfer from the root zone to the uh, to the young uh, growing leaves. Um, so this boundary layer thickness is uh, greater. Uh, when we have stagnant boundary layers around the uh, canopy. So in order, to, in order for us to uh, uh, develop or first understand uh, the, uh, the, uh, the environment in any given design um, or maybe develop uh, alternative designs, there is a need for experimental uh, 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 testing and studies uh, which are uh, cumbersome, uh, uh, time-consuming, expensive, so one way to address that challenge is using computational capabilities, modeling simulation uh, capabilities. And one of them is being computational fluid dynamics. Uh, it's a branch of fluid mechanics that is using numerical analyses to understand, uh, to analyze fluid uh, flow. And it has been around uh, for many, many years in the aerospace, automotive, biomedical, uh, air conditioning areas, uh, or other disciplines to help uh, uh, researchers and developers uh, to, of technologies to uh, analyze uh, the systems and develop alternative uh, designs. Um, so this is a great uh, engineering tool uh, for, for us. And the basis of the fluid dynamics approach, actually the model involves creating a geometry that defines the problem that we are trying to address and uh, dividing that uh, geometry into small finite volumes where the, uh, the fluid flow is actually uh, uh, analyzed uh, in terms of mass, energy, and momentum uh, 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 to um, create uh, a fluid flow um, image uh, for the user to understand uh, the flow uh, characteristics. So this involves uh, a solver uh, and the conservation equations uh, for mass, momentum, and energy, uh, where we are also now able to uh, include plant presence, plant canopy presence in there uh, with proper uh, plant-related uh, information, especially the, uh, the resistance of the plant against uh, the flow with porous media approach and with the transpiration uh, model being incorporated uh, using an external model or users users define function uh, call, uh, we call uh, into the model to uh, uh, consider plant presence in that uh, problem uh, domain. Um, and there are uh, different types of different kinds of challenges in vertical farming settings with uh, 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 transplant production, for example, or maybe with leafy green uh, productions. And as you can see, here's an example of a uh, transplant production with tomato seedlings grown in a vertical farming system where a fan is used on one end of the shelf as we bring in the flow from the other end and passing it through the uh, growing uh, shelf. As you can see, uh, the model uh, is showing here uh, an expected uh, uh, flow pattern and its non-uniformity uh, when these uh, types of uh, uh, air distribution systems are considered. So the question is then would be, okay, what would be alternative uh, to this approach and improve the environmental uniformity uh, in that uh, growing environment? 
So we have been uh, focusing in this uh, area with computational fluid dynamics efforts. And uh, uh, we had our research uh, team, uh, uh, one of the team members have been my former graduate student, Ying Zhang, and she's a faculty member now uh, at the University of uh, Florida. Um, she focused on uh, developing a perforated air tube based uh, air distribution system, which can be positioned maybe uh, between the LED lighting uh, at the ceiling of the shelf to push air vertically down into the canopy to create that uh, uh, dynamic air flow, turbulent air flow, which can enhance the transpiration and improve the uniformity in that environment. Of course, there should be a space between the lighting system and the canopy top surfaces, enabling such uh, system installation to enhance the uh, environmental uniformity or airflow distribution in a system uh, like this. As you can see, different uh, installations were evaluated as part of this design uh, with Ying's uh, uh, effort. But later on, uh, we were also uh, interested in a warehouse-based based system uh, with a larger system installation when it comes to uh, air distribution system alternatives. And here is a part of that research uh, effort um, where we were interested um, the positioning of the uh, inlets and exits uh, for the air, conditioned air to come into the vertical farming space and, and being uh, uh, circulated from uh, the other end. And as you can see, there are different alternative designs here. Our focus was really more towards localized and distributed air uh, uh, flow or air distribution system where uh, uh, we have uh, um, uh, air uh, distribution um, uh, units uh, positioned in each shelf or around the shelves, uh, pushing that um, uh, conditioned air into the growing uh, spaces to improve the, um, to improve the environmental uniformity. So I will just focus on two cases here. As you can see, both inlets and exits are on the ceiling uh, with this uh, design versus a, a distributed localized air distribution system, uh, bringing that air uh, condition there into each shelf. Uh, as you can see the capability in terms of improving the air temperature in this case uh, with such uh, localized distributed airflow um, system application. So uh, we are, we will be continuing uh, with our research uh, in this uh, space uh, as there are different alternative designs. Uh, there is no, at this point, a standard design when it comes to vertical farming systems, but we will continue uh, working with the uh, collaborators and industry uh, participants to uh, help them evaluating their uh, designs. Uh, another um, uh, research uh, uh, program focused on the uh, comparison of energy uh, use efficiencies uh, with the electrical energy use efficiency between greenhouses and indoor plant factory systems, considering different uh, climatic conditions uh, around the world. Here, um, Ying uh, evaluated a greenhouse system uh, as well as a, a, a vertical farming system. Um, located in hot, dry, or hot, humid, or dry, cold uh, areas around the world uh, in terms of the, uh, the division of the energy used for lighting systems, cooling, and heating, as you can see, uh, considering uh, the number of tiers or the efficacies of lights, uh, LED lights being uh, considered, uh, as well as the uh, uh, the comparison between a greenhouse system as well as a vertical farming system. Um, we also considered the, uh, uh, the economizer modes uh, for the vertical farming applications where we can leverage the outdoor environments if they're favorable to bring it and mix it with the internal air to uh, reduce the energy use in a vertical uh, farming system. And in this uh, graph that is in the center, here you can see the, the capabilities or the potentials to reduce the electrical energy used uh, with the consideration of economizer mode. But the, through the modeling and I think simulations, this helps us to create what if scenarios to explore possibilities leading to uh, resource uh, uh, use optimization, both in greenhouses as well as vertical farming uh, systems. 
And the graph uh, on the lower right hand corner here is uh, comparing the uh, vertical farming system um, uh, to a greenhouse based system and based on our analyses and the locations considered and the, this is for lettuce crop actually considered, uh, you can see that the vertical farms are actually uh, very compatible in terms of their energy use efficiencies when it comes to colder climates in this case, based on this analysis, but the greenhouse systems are still slightly uh, more efficient uh, with the, the crop being uh, grown in the greenhouse setting uh, using natural sunlight and capabilities of a greenhouse uh, environment. Uh, we are also emphasizing uh, plant-centric, plant-based, uh, photometric or biofeedback-based uh, control applications in vertical farming space. Uh, we are uh, considering uh, predictive models uh, with, uh, uh, in order to determine the biomass growth, fresh biomass uh, of the produce, um, considering the environmental uh, variables, and combining that with the, with, for example, computer vision systems that can directly uh, inform the grower in terms of the growth and, and a health condition of the crop. Uh, combining these two, uh, I think would be more effective in terms of uh, creating a control strategy uh, for, the, uh, for the controls of the LED lighting, but also uh, other strategies can be developed around other environmental uh, conditions. So uh, we are now uh, conducting this research uh, uh, with, uh, with this effort that also enables us to uh, create, again, what if scenarios to uh, look into co-optimization of variables, for example, uh, what if we can use a given daily light integral with the carbon dioxide uh, concentration level as being considered and uh, leading to resource savings. Here is an example of that uh, using uh, um, uh, the same, um, uh, considering uh, a desired uh, fresh weight uh, outcome, uh, we can dim the lights uh, using a lower daylight integral by enhancing the CO2 injection that would lead to uh, the same uh, yield uh, outcome. Uh, again, in this example, uh, we have about 14% energy uh, savings uh, when we consider this kind of a, a strategy for the environmental uh, control in a vertical farming system. Uh, we are looking into other alternative uh, uh, environmental control applications here. Uh, we are interested in uh, looking into the injection time or the CO2 enrichment uh, period during the growth cycle of the plant. As you can see, our initial early uh, preliminary data is showing that um, uh, maybe uh, 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 a targeted week or targeted growth stage would be more effective uh, with the CO2 applications rather than injecting CO2 all the way from transplanting stage to the harvesting stage uh, to achieve savings uh, with the CO2 enrichment in, in a vertical farming uh, 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 growing, growing settings. Um, plant phenotype is a function of uh, the, its genetics and environment and management. Uh, uh, we can address the environmental uh, conditions uh, through control applications, the management through the growers capabilities, operators capabilities to create or to develop management strategies, uh, but also we will need to look into uh, the improvements uh, of the genetics of the plant and their capabilities to be able to resources more effectively and efficiently when it comes to uh, the light. Uh, the use of uh, light and photons uh, and efficiency uh, to enhance light use efficiency, or maybe other resources, the nutrient uptake and, uh, and the resistance to uh, disease or other environmental conditions in a vertical farming uh, setting. Um, when we combine that biology, enhancing the biology with a, engineering and technology applications, uh, this will uh, lead us towards more resources efficient production uh, capabilities. Uh, some of the critical indicators of the plant and plant response to environment, uh, we would be able, we should be able to capture these through uh, unique sensing and monitoring capabilities with uh, fresh waste, dry weight. Uh, and uh, crop growth uh, characteristics, uh, maybe uh, 
uh, textural uh, uh, characteristics uh, and temporal, again, spatial distribution uh, can be uh, determined through sensing and monitoring applications and integrated into control uh, strategies. When it comes to lighting, uh, there's been a lot of research going on uh, addressing uh, the unique uh, opportunities created by the LED lighting. Uh, however, the focus will continue uh, to be placed on the efficacies and the contro controllability of the LED lighting, uh, 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 separating the research capabilities with practical and commercial applications and defining the wavelengths and there's some standardization needed actually as we define and report those uh, uh, wavelengths uh, as we are addressing unique uh, features of the LED lighting um, and what spectrums to consider for designing and manufacturing for the growers for industrial for commercial uh, applications. Uh, fixtures designs, air installations, and also uh, crop production strategies uh, with the canopy architecture uh, leading towards enhanced light use uh, efficiencies. And I already mentioned about the breeding and improving, improving the biology and the genetics of the crop uh, leading towards uh, enhanced resources efficiencies. Um, we will see uh, uh, circular systems, integrated systems, leveraging uh, the waste materials, uh, maybe resources, um, as, as, as outcomes from one system being an input for another uh, system uh, with our research uh, programs here, we are putting emphasis into circular and integrated systems. And in, an example of this is integration of the mushroom production systems where CO2 is an emitted into the environment as a waste. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, the uh, uh, crop production system in a vertical farm system can actually use that as an input. Uh, where maybe the uh, water from the environment uh, can be harvested and, and, and circulated maybe into the uh, mushroom production system where um, increased level of humidity is needed um, uh, in addition to maybe using some of that uh, recirculating water within the uh, plant uh, production system. Uh, I believe uh, this uh, circular approach or integrated systems approach will uh, lead us to more sustainable plant production systems also in vertical uh, farming uh, 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 settings. Uh, automation uh, and robotics will be critical. Uh, technologies are uh, already existing uh, commercially. Uh, I think we, uh, the companies are looking into uh, their uh, integration to the vertical farming uh, uh, systems, uh, but there will be further developments uh, in terms of automatic automation and robotics uh, because labor is uh, one of the significant input um, and challenge when it comes to uh, vertical farming uh, applications. Um, uh, Internet of Things uh, and uh, uh, sensors, uh, cloud-based uh, computing and services for data access and management will continue to be uh, uh, in important uh, as we uh, provide uh, access uh, with meaningful information uh, for the growers uh, to, um, to um, create an environment uh, and production capabilities in the vertical uh, farming space. I believe augmented and virtual reality uh, will also play a role, significant role in terms of remote connectivity to the production system, maybe um, uh, virtual advising uh, with again, unique capabilities, uh, combining the physical environment with the biological environment uh, for unique experiences and capabilities as we uh, would look into future vertical farming system applications. AI, the artificial intelligence, uh, will be an important and integral part of our future uh, production capabilities, not only in vertical farming space, but also in greenhouses. Uh, AI will not replace the green thumbs. We will continue to need that green thumb and expertise and experiences of growers and their capabilities. But I think AI will enhance uh, and empower uh, the grower and grower capabilities and production capabilities in a controlled environment agriculture uh, settings. We will need to further understand again plant environment interactions, uh, effectively use the models that are capable of predicting the plant response as well as the growing environments. Uh, uh, so uh, we will see more data-centric, more plant-centric, but data-centric um, 
AI-based applications towards the, the future. As we are trying to address these challenges uh, uh, and develop technologies for earth-based systems with vertical farms and greenhouses, we also have uh, uh, research programs uh, trying to develop alternatives and technologies um, and systems that would enable us to use resources more efficiently uh, as we meet, as we are needing to meet the challenges of growing crops and produce in microgravity settings or maybe Mars lunar surfaces, um, uh, moon surfaces uh, to help uh, uh, for the long uh, duration missions uh, in, the, in the space environments. Um, I would like to uh, 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 mention about uh, our uh, uh, International Society of Horticulture uh, uh, Sciences talks on vertical farming. These are webinar series that uh, we've been uh, collaborating with my colleagues, uh, Francis Orsini uh, from Bologna University and uh, Leo Marcellis from Wageningen. Uh, with our uh, colleagues participating, both from academia and industry. Uh, these are short uh, presentations addressing some of the challenges in the vertical farming space uh, and exciting uh, information shared here. So I would encourage uh, our participants to follow us. And I, uh, I have the link here uh, for the Horty Dialogue series on vertical uh, farming. And I'm also excited uh, to be among uh, uh, the panelists uh, for the upcoming uh, American Society of Horticultural Sciences conference uh, workshop on integrating engineering principles with plant biological requirements for controlled environment agriculture research and education, uh, joining my colleagues and expertise uh, for this discussion uh, in about 10 days as we will talk about uh, how can we uh, integrate both the plant sciences, the biology, uh, along with the engineering, both in research and education uh, as, uh, uh, for us to uh, uh, produce uh, graduates of our programs uh, uh, meeting the expectations of the uh, industry or enhance our capabilities, both on the biology and plant sciences, as well as the engineering uh, with the proper uh, curriculums uh, for us to do the research and also educate our future leaders of the controlled environment agriculture uh, industry. So I'm very excited. I hope that uh, some of our participants will be able to attend and participate there because this will not be a virtual uh, workshop. But I would like to say that uh, the industry is demanding for graduates uh, who are uh, knowledge about uh, not only with the biology and the plant requirements, but also understanding the technology and engineering. I'm really pleased uh, with the emphasis and resources uh, actually put forward uh, from uh, institutions uh, uh, in the US uh, uh, towards the controlled environment agriculture programs. Uh, uh, we will need to uh, 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 have that growth and uh, grow the collaborations and the innovations together within the academic space, but also with the industry's uh, participation. So with that, I would like to, uh, again, thank for the opportunity. And I hope we have a few uh, times remaining if uh, I can maybe use that time to address some of the questions. So thank you. Thanks, Murat. Great presentation. So much data, so much information. It's hard, it's hard to pick up where you start with the questions. Uh, but yeah, exciting, this panel coming up, it's fantastic at the ASHS, so really, really excited. Uh, so Murat, let me see here, I have a few questions that came uh, through the audience and I have a few on my own as well, but let me start with the, with the audience. It's come that they, and as they come in order, so I think the first one was about, when you're talking about the vision systems uh, at the beginning, so with that work, question is if it's possible to apply computer vision on the biomass prediction with other crops other than lettuce. Uh, and I think the, the question here is around, think about spinach or arugula. Can you apply that and, and try to predict the biomass production considering the non-edible parts of those crops? Is that something that is possible to be addressed? Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, the non-edible parts uh, of the crop, um, uh, I, I believe there needs to, uh, 
I think we will need to develop some correlations there uh, with the edible portion versus non-edible portion. And this can probably be achieved through some you know, research uh, uh, applications where you can uh, develop some maybe models um, around it um, as we are maybe deploying sensors to monitor the the shoot, the vegetable, you know, the shoot part of the plant, maybe uh, uh, relating that uh, growth and uh, uh, and uh, growth pattern to the non-edible portion of the plants. Uh, so I think it will be a collaboration of maybe a computer vision system directly providing some information, but maybe correlating that to uh, other uh, parts of the plant uh, where maybe the monitoring system is not able to directly see it, but maybe through uh, uh, correlation to be able to um, have an idea or understanding of that non-edible uh, portions. Um, uh, definitely, I think for plant health monitoring um, uh, through computer vision, uh, through sensing, um, it will be desirable to deploy and consider sensors where you are able to monitor the uh, aerial environment of the plant, but also the uh, the root zone conditions in a in a practical practical and and low cost uh, uh, approach and and, and enabling uh, uh, data collection and understanding interpreting of that data for uh, I think uh, commercial applications or practical applications. Perfect. And I we just got a question related to that. Mm -hmm. So we're changing it yeah. up. If you could talk a little bit about. Uh, the possibility of using computer vision and horticultural yeah. products like strawberries or tomatoes. So I think yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. So with the computer vision, uh, uh, we have different capabilities. We can look into again growth, the physical growth of the plant. We can look into temperature of the crop, which can be related to stress conditions, right? The water stress, uh, for example, as plants are not able to dissipate that heat because of sensible heat and converting that into latent heat, which is the transpiration mechanism. Uh, the temperature of the plant or the canopy is increased. And that is an indicator of a plant stress when it comes to water stress. But you can also see temperature increase from a plant if the plant is also deficient with specific nutrients or maybe a disease infestation. So um, we need to develop capabilities uh, and this can come through actually artificial intelligence, maybe machine learning and deep learning to create that uh, uh, baseline uh, and thresholds where we are able to identify where the stress is coming from. That has been the, the most significant challenge when it comes to uh, computer vision applications, right? Being able to differentiate where the stress is coming from. So I think AI, deep learning, machine learning is bringing that capabilities for us to further these technologies. For, for strawberries, for tomatoes, you know, with multispectral or hyperspectral sensing, we can look into the disease occurrences or maybe the flavor. You know, we can go deeper into the uh, cell structure of the plant, not just stay on the surface of the plant. Color can be an indicator. Again, um, um, secondary metabolites or the nutrition of the plant can be correlated to some of the uh, hyperspectral features or spectral features uh, of the uh, of the plant. Uh, we have the abilities through fluorescence sensing to look into reflectance of the plant and and have an idea about plant stresses uh, around it. So um, with the strawberry again, tomato, it could be yield prediction, it could be disease identification, or maybe the nutrition um, uh, or nutritional stresses, uh, but that will further uh, require for uh, um, uh, databases and, and uh, you know, uh, deep learning and understanding of that stress behavior. Perfect. Perfect. And yeah, I think we can go so many questions that can come out of all those topics. Uh, so one, just before I go, a broad question here. You just mentioned about the data analysis, creating those databases so they can learn, they can get more experience. We talk to growers, commercial growers and researchers. Everybody agrees uh, on the power of the data analysis, those big data sets that you can, you can take, you can analyze, you can train the machines, the algorithms, uh, but everybody's really reluctant, especially the, the private industry, not so much the researchers, but the private industry. They see the value, they wanna get the benefits, but very reluctant to share the data. So 
how do you think we're gonna we're gonna address those needs? Uh, do you think they will ever share the data? Can we make a compiling case for them? We, we've been this battle for a long time, but everybody likes the benefits, to understand. So, sure. what do yeah, you think about that? that's a that's a great question. I think it's it's needed uh, for anyone in the research arena or maybe in the commercial you know, R&D space, uh, data is critical, uh, especially when it comes to modeling, when it comes to deep learning, machine learning, AI applications. Um, uh, uh, there are limitations uh, for us as researchers, you know, depending on the, the sponsors and how, you know, uh, uh, the funding flows in. Um, it is more flexible when we have funding from, you know, uh, state or federal governments. But I think and when it comes to commercial and industry uh, space, uh, they have the proprietary technologies, so they keep it kind of uh, uh, in-house. Uh, but I think... Uh, uh, as we uh, share data uh, from controlled environment agriculture systems uh, um, uh, collaboratively, I think this will speed up the process in terms of our uh, technology development and in terms of uh, system, you know, uh, systems development or uh, control strategies and our capabilities. I, I think that will be critical and one a good example of that, the, the initiative that you are also leading uh, and involved, uh, right, the data sharing platform that has been started a while ago with some, uh, I think, challenges there in terms of the, uh, the the magnitude or the scale of the data that we have, data base we have. But I think we should continue collaborating on that as best as we can. Uh, there are some data sets that I think that can be shared from coming from the academic uh, academic uh, institutions as well as um, uh, from the from the uh, industry uh, and some of these data can also maybe can be created uh, when it comes to environmental conditions of course the plant responses is a very unique data set that needs to be uh, maybe created but we can maybe create some training data through simulation and modeling efforts so um, and, and use it in a strategic, unique ways. But I think that is critical. And we will also need standardization when, it, when we look into environmental conditions and how the data is being reported in the controlled environment agriculture space. Uh, what is the metric? What are the metrics that we need to use when, it, we, when, we, when we evaluate different kinds of systems, greenhouse and vertical farms? And there has been an initiative around this called SEEDS, right? Erico, you are part of that. Uh, initiative, and we have been collaborating with my colleagues and some of my students in that initiative, and there will be a presentation about it uh, in the indoor econ in October, uh, in a kind of conversation towards, you know, can we develop, can we use standardized way of uh, analyzing, designing, you know, the, the systems, the hardware, uh, the control applications, or maybe reporting the data uh, with, uh, with relevant metrics. So they are fair in terms of comparisons and they are fair in terms of we evaluate any given system and try to optimize it so i'm i'm really excited about uh, that effort and looking uh, forward to our colleagues to uh, to present about it. i believe you will be joining uh, maybe my uh, friend and colleague uh, dr Gary studi uh, in that presentation so uh, i'd like to commend you on that and, and that initiative yeah that's a great point i think we should do a webinar with those those folks here to talk about that. It's a great point, Murat. Uh, so going back to some of the more specific questions, one of them is, uh, so hello, Professor Murat. Thanks for the, the presentation. Do you think it is important to investigate evapotranspiration phenomena in indoor crops? Uh, evapotranspiration, what again? Phenomena. So just the, the evapotranspiration. So I think take that in consideration into the modeling and all oh, yeah. the... Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think, um, of course, depending on the objective here, but uh, I think plants are an important part of that equation or the energy balance of the greenhouse system as well as the vertical farm. Um, if you go into a, a, an empty greenhouse versus a plant, a greenhouse where you have plants, uh, the environment is really totally different. Plants are actually coolers, you know, uh, they cool their environment as they transpire. So that uh, transpired water absorbs the heat, uh, cooling that environment, but it also adds water and humidity, water content into that environment. And that becomes the 
overall energy and mass balance of that system when we're trying to address the required energy for cooling, dehumidification, and how we handle that humidity and water in that environment, or also cooling capabilities, you know, how we can manage that sensible heat building up, you know, with the latent heat um, there. So yes, uh, when it comes to, I think, addressing or designing the, uh, the air conditioning systems, uh, and also modeling effort, it, there needs to be uh, that emphasis and consideration for, uh, I would say, transpiration, assuming that the uh, open surfaces are limited to none in a controlled environment, agriculture system, system uh, most of the time that's the case. So the evapo part of it, open surface evaporation is eliminated, so we're focusing on transpiration only. Perfect. And then related to that, I think it's a good question here. Uh, saying that optimizing canopy energy balance does not translate into optimized growth, right? So that's the question. And then the part is, uh, can we do, can we translate the energy balance into the biomass growth if you include uh, biomass growth factors into the system, into the equations? Oh yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, there has to be a balance in terms of uh, the plant growth and um, and as well as allocation of resources in the plant towards the as a vegetative part and reproductive parts of it. And there, has, there must be a balance. When it comes to greenhouses, this is very critical. So the data collected from the crop registrations or through the sensors are considered to create that balance. Uh, so we are uh, optimal in terms of the resources we are using, or we have a more balanced crop to to respond to that environment and then produce. Uh, similarly, in vertical farming systems, I think uh, considering both the biomass growth or resource allocation, uh, as well as the, again, energy balance and how the resources are utilized by the crop is gonna be critical. So we have to, we have to uh, consider that balance with the biomass growth as well as the surrounding environment and how plant is responding to that. And our ability to keep that balance is going to be critical. Um, uh, I know that we always aim optimal conditions, and that demands for a cost. Uh, there is a cost for any given action. But I'm also a believer of maybe pushing plants out of their comfort zone, again, with an acceptable plant yield and quality attributes. But I think with that strategy, we would be able to achieve resource savings in terms of electrical energy or other resources that we are using. Um, if we pay attention to the resources efficiency as a metric, I think we will do a much better job in terms of resource use in either controlled environment agriculture system. And it's definitely becoming more and more important, the, the energy consumption, the energy balance part, and the intensity and this efficacy, that's, that's good, I agree more. Um, so I think we have one more specific question. For CO2 enrichment solutions, how good is to add diffused CO2 in mist water instead of doing into a gas form? I don't know if you talk about that. It's a very specific question. Uh, yeah, that's a very spe specific question. And I started hearing about it as well. I've heard about it before. And um, uh, I, I will need to... I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that. I would like to see maybe some uh, testing and studying of that um, uh, in greenhouse uh, systems and or controlled environment agriculture setting to to first understand the the, the, the transport mechanism there and the the uh, the, the, the plants uh, response to that. Uh, I think strategy. Um, at this point, I don't have a clear answer to that. Perfect. Yeah, that's good to be discussing these new trends. Mm -hmm. I think the, the last one, Murat, to, to finalize our presentation, and we're just at the top of the hour. Uh, you talk about AI and human assisted systems, right? That's always an interesting one. So in your point of view, uh, we're always gonna need the help or the supervision of the human. How do you see this transition takes place? Do you think you're gonna be a fast transition into more and more uh, you know, autonomous greenhouses? Do you think this process might take a few years? Do you think there is a specific segments? Can you talk a little bit about this scenario and then I think we can conclude the webinar? 
Yeah, I think that's a great uh, discussion there and question. Uh, I think, you know, for any technology uh, penetration into a commercialization or, or practical use, uh, there is that adaptation phase and, 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 and timing. Uh, it will depend on the users. It, it will depend on the operator's willingness to integrate more technology, more uh, advanced, uh, you know, way of uh, doing things. I, I think uh, there is already a maturity in terms of the automation and certain robotics applications which are out there available. It will just be the willingness to integrate them and address the labor challenges and energy challenges. I believe um, uh, the leafy green production can be, you know, highly automated and fully automated, you know, with the, from the seed all the way through the uh, packaging. Um, the technology exists out there and there are companies actually incorporating that into their uh, systems and, and, and applications. Um, um, uh, I think uh, it will depend on uh, the technology, the investment and uh, users capabilities and experiences and willingness to incorporate these technologies. Uh, I see AI again, automation um, being a, a tool, a great tool, great uh, way of uh, enhancing or empowering the growers' capabilities. Uh, but I think we will still require uh, that uh, 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 experience the uh, eye and hands and mind of the grower uh, in that, uh, in that uh, decision-making uh, or, or production practices. Uh, there will be a co uh, cooperation and collaboration of the human as well as machine uh, in the uh, in the production space. Uh, again, some of these technologies are ready and being implemented. So there is no uh, uh, phase there. Uh, it's going to be quick, but some of the others will, I think, need some uh, uh, experimentation, understanding, and, and seeing the benefits, confirming the benefits in terms of their economics and return of investment uh, when it comes to uh, robotics automation applications. Sure. Well, uh we have more questions that we're not going to have time to answer. I have 15 more questions as well. <laughs> so I really appreciate, Murad. That's a, that's a fantastic topic. There's so much to be learned, so much to transfer. We can talk about this for hours. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you so much again for the opportunity. Uh, please, uh, our participants, thank you for your participation and your time. If you have any questions and you want to follow up with me, um, I'm sure you you will easily find me. Uh, so um, uh, I look forward to uh, our uh, follow-up conversation. So again, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, and I look forward to seeing uh, you all somehow, somewhere in person. We are looking yeah. forward to that. So well, thank you so much for right. participating. Thanks everyone for thank attending. You. If you guys have any questions, you can contact me. You have my email. I can forward to Dr. Kosira and we go from there. Thank you so much, Murat. Have a great day. Thank you so much. You too, bye. my friend. All right, bye-bye.